Um, yeah. You know, it's great to have you here, Coach, on this talk today. Um, I said a little bit earlier, we tried recording this before, but we had a connection uh, difficulty. I've, I've known Coach um, Young since 2016, December. We've been connected. He is one of the most successful coaches in college tennis history. He runs an amazing program. He's a director of tennis and um, head women's coach at Oklahoma State. It's great to have him here. Um, coach, can you please tell us a little bit about your, sorry, again, your playing career and your coaching career? Yeah, you know, as a kid, I grew up um, playing all sports, but tennis was, was something that really became a passion of mine. And, um, you know, as I was sharing with you a little bit earlier, it was always a goal of mine to be a collegiate athlete. I think that's something that, you know, maybe not all international kids um, grow up, but American kids, I think, you know, you grow up and sure, you always want to play at the highest level, but being a, a division one athlete, being a college athlete is something that's really important. So for me, it was like, you know, what sport's going to give me the best chance to right. do that? And I quickly found out that tennis was that. And, and then, you know, transitioning, um, you know, into uh, in, into college tennis was something that was just such a great experience for me. And, um, you know, that's, that's why I'm still doing what I do today. Amazing. And you played at an NAIA program. How was that experience? Yeah, you know, I started at Lipscomb University, a small like Division One. Actually, it was NAI at the time, but it was transitioning to Division One in right. Nashville, Tennessee. And then um, Oklahoma Christian transitioned there for my last couple of years. And you know, NAI was such a strong level in the 90s because, um, you know, there you could you could play professional tennis, accept the prize money, people of all ages, basically. You know, NAI, you had players 30 years old competing against 18 year olds. And, um, you know, there really wasn't um, as strict of the standards. So the quality was just as high as, as any level. And it gave people a chance to do that. You know, since then, it's tightened up quite a bit. And, you know, now they have even stricter age requirements than a division two or, or, you know, just as strict as division one. So you don't have, you know, the, the older players playing there, but for me, it was a great experience because I got to compete with, with um, some people that had a lot of professional experience. were still out there trying to play on the tour themselves. They kind of been through a lot of things that I hadn't and really educated me on, on how tough it was to be successful at the highest level and how you needed to train to do that. And, um, you know, on my team, my last year, uh, six of us all became college tennis coaches following our career. And so, wow. <laughs> you know, division one to division yeah. two to, you know, so um, pretty much everybody, all those guys at least have had at least a stint division one. So all of us just had a passion for it. We had a great experience. I think that says a lot about our coach and yeah. about the coaches that we had that gave us that experience. And I finished in 1999 and in 2000 I had the opportunity to begin my coaching career there. They asked me to stay on and um, be the assistant coach and, and there, you know, a smaller school, you do everything. So I was assistant coach for men and women. Um, and it was just a great experience. Unfortunately, our head coach in 2001 got the news. He had colon cancer. So in that spring, I took over both programs by myself, no assistant coach. Um, How old were you and that was, I was uh, 20, would have been 23 years old. I'm so 28. I was <laughs> yeah. Incredible. And, and I was, you know, coaching some players that I played with, you know, teammates, yeah. but, but the good thing, like I said, you know, uh, NAI then like you had a lot of older players. So I was 23 going on to 24, turned 24 that spring. And, you know, I had a 26 year old guy that was the captain of my team and he knew that, you know, Hey, this is, this is a lot for this guy. And, he and I had a great relationship and, uh, you know, he helped me a lot and, and some, some older girls. And then in 2003, the, the coach came back and we won the national championship on the men's side. And so just understanding kind of what it took and, um, you know, all that was a great experience. Um, then I went to Wichita state in 2000 and right after the 2004 season and was at Wichita state till 2009. When I got there, they had never made the NCAA tournament in the history of Wichita State. And in my second year, we made the NCAA tournament. And in the third year, we, we advanced to the second round of the NCAAs and never before had a team in um, a Missouri Valley Conference team won a NCAA tournament match. So that was a big deal for us. And we also achieved the highest ranking of a Missouri Valley team, men or women. At number 16, Brian Bolin had coached at yep. Indiana State. He had coached Indiana State and the record was 17. He got them to 17 in the country. So 
I always had this goal of getting a team to be 16 in the country and I achieved that. And, uh, you know, not too long ago, he and I were having a conversation and he was like, you know, you beat my record, right? Like, you know, when you were so state, I said, Oh yeah, I know that. I was like, that was like one of my goals from day one. So. <laughs> I would have I would have played it the other way. Would I would have said, "Oh, really? Did I?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I wanted him to know. I knew for sure that I did that. Yeah. It wasn't lost on me. Yeah. Oh no, that's absolutely incredible. You had such an amazing time, um, obviously playing, and it's great to hear how well you did coaching. You know what? The word that you keep using, experiences, is massive. There's coaches that get a bit of paper and they 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 go and coach programs. But then I find that the college coaches that I really like networking with and connecting with are those that have been through a lot before, not that have just got a qualification. And you have like learned stuff that you just can't teach from a book. You've been through all sorts of different experiences. Does that, is that the reason why your team is so successful today at Oklahoma State and you've got the record that you have? Yeah, you know, I think that, that, that there's something to be said for coaching maybe at a smaller school with not as many resources not taking anything for granted. Um, and, and then I think also just what your mission is as a coach. Every coach wants to do it a little bit differently. For me, it's about having relationships with players to where I can give them the best experience, going back to that word, possible. Because, you know, when the players are in an environment where they feel safe, healthy, protected, they, where a lot of growth can happen, where they feel like the coach really is trying to give them um, you know, the best experience possible, their tennis game is going to thrive. They're going right. to grow as a person. They're going to be happy, um, you know, and everything comes together when the environment is good, when the culture is good. You know, we talk a lot about culture and the world of sports, but, you know, chemistry between players and everybody getting along and having, you know, uh, relationships. I, you know, some of my best friends are people that I played college tennis with. And because of that, I, re I understand the value of it and I understand how important it is. Um, and I want that for, for my players. And then, you know, I think just the, the schools that I've coached at, whether it's Oklahoma Christian or it's Wichita State or it's Oklahoma State, have not traditionally been tennis powers. They're not names that people think of first. Um, and so the challenge for me at each of those three stops is to build a program. And to do that, typically you start with an administration that doesn't understand what a successful tennis program looks like because they haven't had one before. And so it's kind of up to you to be able to show them that vision, have a vision for the program, whether it's with your players, with your administration and with everyone around you that, hey, this is what we're going to do here. We're going to build a successful program. We're going to have a great, great time doing it and the players are going to get better and grow. And so I think ultimately I've learned pretty much every um, – area of, of being a coach. And I think at the last two stops, Wichita State and Oklahoma State, I've risen to the, the level of director of tennis where I oversaw both programs and had a, had a role in, in leading those programs. And so I think that just comes from having experience, if, if nothing else. Every, every Kiwi in New Zealand, or most Kiwis in New Zealand, they know Oklahoma for our basketball player that played for the Oklahoma Thunder, Stephen Adams. Yeah, yeah. Big Steve Kiwi. Adams. He's a legend around here. Yeah. And so have you seen him before? I, I've watched him play. I've never got a chance to, to meet him. Um, but, yeah, he's uh, he's a legend around here. And, you know, unfortunately he hasn't had success since he left the Thunder. But he was somebody that uh, everybody here looked up to. He was great in the community. I think he, uh, you know, he did a great job connecting. And that's the thing about Oklahoma. I think it's a, it's a place where people are so friendly and kind of the expectation that you're going to, um, you know, to look after each other, connect with people, that's really important. That's what makes Oklahoma State special. And that's what I think makes the Oklahoma City Thunder special as they get out in the community. Steven Adams is always doing um, events in the community, giving back with camps and those things. So yeah, he's, um, he's a legend. He's quirky. He has a great sense of humor. People just love his interviews and listening to him and, and we all miss him here in Oklahoma for sure I don't know if you know about his family but his his family are pretty successful here in New Zealand his sister's an Olympian for New Zealand um Valerie Adams shot putter she's going to the Olympics she's she's incredible absolutely yeah, incredible. A, a big big family right and yeah a lot, of, a lot of good athletes yeah so yep and the thing I like about Stephen Adams is 
Um, even though this is a tennis interview, I love it how we're talking about an NBA player. But what I like about Stephen Adams is that he's probably the richest sports athlete we have in New Zealand, but he's so low key. He's yeah. so chill. Like he just doesn't show it. Yeah, De definitely. I mean, he seems just like a guy you would want to hang out with. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. hopefully maybe one day we'll both get that chance. Yeah. A guy that you want to hang out with, but, but not piss off, you know, <laughs> that's exactly right. You want him on your side. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. For athletes that have never been to Oklahoma state, obviously everyone's seen the videos. We know how amazing the facilities are, but for someone that, goes there every day. Can you please paint a picture of what it's like? Yeah, you know, I think Oklahoma State is a, is a unique place because we have 26,000 students, but the campus is the campus is like pretty compact. So most of our kids um, come here and they can walk from their apartment to their tennis, to the tennis center, to um, where they eat, to where they go to class. Everything's within like a mile and a half square block. So everything's pretty compact. I find that for international kids, it's very appealing because they don't have to have a car. They can walk or bike or do everything. Um, the campus is very safe. It's a very safe community. It's a kind of a small community around the university and everything is kind of focused on the university. And, um, you know, I think when you're a tennis player at Oklahoma State, you're kind of a big deal in the community because people really love, love supporting our athletes and our tennis programs had success. So the kids that come into our program, people know them in the community. So that I think the kids really enjoy that. They go to dinner or things like that and they're recognized and people tell them they enjoy watching them play. So those types of things are nice, but you know, there's not a lot of distractions. I think the kids that come here, come here with the idea that they want to focus on their tennis game and really improve it to a high level with not having maybe a lot of distractions. You know, there may be other places that are in, that are in bigger cities um, maybe more recognizable cities, uh, but maybe it takes them a little bit longer to get around the campus to get to get to class. Maybe there's some challenges there that make life a little bit more stressful. Um, so for us, you know, you know how long it takes you to get somewhere. It's all pretty simple. Everything's close together. Um, you know, the kids, I think, don't have as much stress in um, getting their schoolwork done, getting over to getting over to practice, getting to where they need to go to eat dinner. Um, all of our facilities, whether it's our tennis center, as you've talked about, is obviously what we're most proud of because we feel it's one of the best tennis centers, I think, in the world. You know, I mean, it's uh, there's not many that are going to rival it. Um, so we give our kids a great chance to train every day. But then the other facilities, whether they, they eat with other athletes every day, we have breakfast and dinner with all the athletes in a, a cafeteria style place that is first class, whether they go to study um, is, is in a great place. We have an athletic center that has our basketball arena. Um, wrestling is a big sport here. We have a lot of Olympians and national champions that come out of our wrestling program. Um, all of that is in one arena area where also has uh, our strength training and our fitness uh, facilities, our study, study hall center for the athletes. Everything's kind of there. So you know, most of the kids that come to Oklahoma State, they get to spend a lot of time around other athletes as well. And I think that's really important. When you come over and you're around other athletes, you think, I'm not, I'm not the only one. You know, I'm not the only one that has to manage my time, manage my studies, train at this level. I'm around golfers, wrestlers, basketball players, football players, uh, track and field, um, you know, all these other athletes that want to be the best in their sport. You know, we have a lot of Olympians uh, this year from Oklahoma State, and whether it's track and field, wrestling, um, we have some some of the best golfers in the world. Um, yeah. You know, are on our on our golf in our golf program, and so um, you know, I think that's that's really inspiring to be around other people who are the best in their sport or trying to be the best in their sport to train like it. Um, only three schools in the United States in Division One have won more national championships than us. So we're, we've won the fourth most national championships of any university in the U.S. So just Incredible. Stanford, UCLA, and USC have more than us. But after those three schools, we're number four. And I think that's remarkable for a school that maybe people don't know a lot about or doesn't first come to mind um, if you're not from this area. But but we, we achieve at a high level because kids come here and they have great facilities and great opportunities to train at high levels with good coaches and, and good resources. 
I think what really excites me about your program is the quality, as you said, like the quality of not just the athletes, but the support that you get over there. The facilities are first class. Um, the strength and conditioning trainers are super well experienced and have worked with professional athletes in the past. I think that's really good. The value that athletes get out of that program is good. And, you know, there's always that thing. You are the company that you keep. So if you are surrounded by people that are lethargic and not wanting to train, obviously you're not going to succeed, right? And so with you guys at your school, with all these top players that are going to the Olympics, excelling in their sports, you know, you want to do more. Is that what you that's find right. over there? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, like you said, I think it's um, every sport here matters, you know, where, you know, sometimes in, in the United States, you know, everybody's like, it's all about football and trying to, you know, have a great football program. And that's important here at Oklahoma State, but every sport here matters. And I think whether you're a male or female athlete, whatever sport you play, whether you're a tennis player or you're a football player or a soccer player or whatever it may be, you, you matter here and uh, you're going to have every resource possible whether it's facilities, whether it's coaching, as you mentioned, strength and conditioning. Our strength and conditioning coach here has been with me now 16 years. He was with me at Wichita State. He was wow. with me here at Oklahoma State. And so um, I think there's the value of just having good people that know what they're doing, that are caring about the student athletes, caring about the experience that they have and making sure that they have every resource possible to be good. And I think that's our job as coaches is to give the athletes every resource possible to be the best they can be. And then it's up to them what they do with it. But we want to inspire them to put them in the right arena, in the right uh, training environment. And then um, no excuses there. You know, it's up to you to see how good you can become. For sure. A lot of the girls that come to your program, and I know you're the director of tennis, so the guys as well that come to your program, they have aspirations of becoming professional athletes. How many of those athletes have are now currently on the ITF Pro Circuit right now? Yes, yeah, so you know the last several years we've really had some some successful players. Aliona Bolsova is probably the highlight. She played on our team in 2017, and then in 2019 she made the fourth round of the French Open, and yeah. she's she's been inside the top hundred now for for a while. And actually, just spent some time with her this week. Um, just finishing up uh, after Wimbledon and, and then playing a, a couple of events, talking with her and still keeping in touch with her and, and talking through, you know, whether it's, I might know a, an opponent that she's playing or, um, you know, an event that she's at, different things to give her help. Um, you know, we had Haley Carter come in and work with us as assistant coach in 2018, the next year, straight out of college, um, but maybe had lost her passion for, for playing a little bit. She came, worked with us for a year, and then, then she decided, wow, you know, after being here for a year and, and working with this program, I've found my passion again for playing, and, and now she's a top 25 doubles player in the world, and, and she helped me in 2018. We had an NCAA doubles team that made the finals, the NCAA finals, and that one of those girls, Blady Bobic, then went on to reach uh, 150, um, within a year, you know, she, she makes the NCAA finals in 2018 by 2019, she um, is 150 in the world in doubles and the ITF gave her um, some funding to be able to kind of move forward. She's from Montenegro. So kind of an underdeveloped country. Um, so really happy with, with her progress, you know, COVID kind of shut things down for her a little bit and, and what she was able to do. But um, you know, I feel like the last several years, we've had eight years in a row now where we've had a player make All-American, and uh, each of those kids go out and do well. We have um, a girl that was an All-American for us in 2019, Katie Stresnikova. She's been doing a lot in England. They had that UK Pro League, and she's continuing her education uh, over there in a graduate program, but also trying to, to play some more there. And, um, and I think we have a lot of young kids right now that uh, we have, uh, you know, players from Japan, Thailand. Um, you know, we have a girl from Finland coming in in August and they all have aspirations to play pro and they're coming in already with a ranking around 500 WTA. So, uh, you know, it's our job to try to help these kids get uh, further on in their career. And, and that's what we hope that we'll put a few more out there in Grand Slams uh, these next few years. But, you know, the last couple of years, in every one of the Grand Slams, we've had a singles, a doubles, you know, sometimes even mixed doubles uh, players that, you know, have represented our program at some, at some point, um, you know, since 2016. 
I know a lot of coaches in New Zealand that are listening to this are probably going to be thinking, how can I get a job in the US? Because that sounds yeah. amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. We're very fortunate, lucky. Uh, I don't take it for granted, you know, how blessed I am to be able to get to do what what I do. And, um, you know, it's a lifelong goal to be in this position and I get to live it every day. And it's not really a job, you know, you, you get to do what you love every day and be around these kids. and They keep you young and fresh and you know, I just finished um, year 21, you know, in college coaching and, and I still feel like I have a lot more to learn and grow from. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, an exciting profession to be in for sure. That's amazing. In terms of like uh, the girls that come there, what really uh, makes me happy is that these girls are coming there. They're getting access to these amazing resources to get to work with you. And they get to play against some of the best competition in the country, all on a scholarship. And they're studying as well. So these girls that are playing at the slams have got a degree in their back pocket. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it is amazing because, you know, at some point in time, um, you know, tennis is going to end. And then, then you want to set yourself up for an even greater future. Also, I think that it um, helps your tennis to be able to have a diversion at times or something else to think about, you know, when... Bolsova was here. She took um, um, a design class where she she learned about fashion design. And so when she's on the road with us, I remember she had a sketchbook and she's drawing all kinds of clothing designs and handbags and yeah. these things. And she's showing me and then she would go into a lab and she would sew them together or do different things. And that gave her a mental break from tennis, you know, to be able to exercise her mind and something else. And so I think it works in two ways, you know, the kids grow and they mature, they exercise their mind, they grow. I think tennis is a very intellectual game. And I think you need to stimulate yourself in many areas with your mind to be able to grow. And I think that's only gonna help your tennis game as well. And, you know, balancing that is a challenge. I think that's sometimes what people are a little bit fearful of. Oh, you know, I go to college and now I have to study plus train plus do all that. But I think that's part of maturing as a person too, is understanding your priorities and understanding the things that you need to do every day, having a schedule and doing that, because, you know, you're going to get burnt out if you do only one thing all the time, every single day. Um, you know, you need kind of some breaks for your mind to yeah. stimulate your mind in other areas. For sure. In terms of scheduling, what does a day look like for your girls? Because there's a lot that athletes do. There's a lot of like conditioning and training and studying and shoot prep, et cetera. What does a day look like for girls that are like 16 to 15 that are listening to this for the first time? Yeah, so typically we do fitness in the mornings just to kind of get them going in the day. And also their bodies are fresh. Yeah. And um, so we would train seven to eight with some sort of fitness. You know, some days we're lifting, some days we're on the court. Um, with just uh, speed training, some footwork, uh, you know, a combination of those things. We would typically do that from like seven to eight, and then the girls go have breakfast together. Um, and then throughout the rest of the morning, the girls are either in class or when they're not in class, they, they typically come and do about 45 minutes with the coaches one-on-one. -on -one. And we have, um, we call areas of focus. So we have two or three things that with the girls we're working on specifically, whether it's technical or maybe strategy or, um, you know, some areas of their game that we want to improve. You know, I think sometimes everybody likes to solve 10 things at one time and it's hard to really make too many changes when you're focusing on so many things. And we just try to break it down and look, if a player comes to us and each semester of their academic career, they get two things better. Well, then that's four things a year. And then if they stay four years, they've gotten better in 16 areas of their game or their life or their fitness, that, that becomes a lot better player and a lot better person there. So, you know, they come for 45 minutes each day and they, they get some work one-on-one -on -one with the coaches. Maybe they come with another member of the team who's also working on something similar and they work on it together. So like two girls with two coaches. And then in the afternoons, um, you know, we, we come back about 2.30, 3 o'clock and we do point play, match play um, as a team. We do a lot of competition and things where we try to take what we've done with their 45-minute training session individually, and we put it into play. The good thing about being on a team is you might have eight to ten girls, and they all have different game styles. Yeah. So if we're working with you on 
you know, your slice backhand and, you know, you might have a girl that also does the same thing or a girl that hits a heavy ball or, you know, maybe you're looking at transitioning forward. And so we're going to put you against players that are going to challenge that, maybe give you some shorter balls to look at. Um, so with that, I think that's the exciting part about college tennis is you have so many different game styles that each day you can play against different players with different game styles, different approaches, be working on your game. And then hopefully when you get into a match situation, a tournament situation, nothing is going to surprise you because you've worked on it in practice, you're prepared for those moments. And so a typical day for the girls is seven to eight fitness, um, you know, a 45 minute individual throughout the day, two to three hours of academic work in the classroom, um, you know, two more hours of a team practice where they're playing points, uh, working on strategy. And then the girls go have dinner about um, 5.30, 6 o'clock. They have dinner together. Uh, and then it's time for studying with whatever they need. They can go into our um, academic services area and get tutoring in any class that they need. Maybe they have a math exam coming up and we get them a special tutor for, for that class. Any class they need, they can get a tutor. So typically they'll all go there, you know, after they get done with dinner, maybe 6.30 and study for an hour, hour and a half, um, you know, if they, if they need it with their classes, maybe more, maybe less. Um, and then, you know, whatever other activities they want, or maybe they're just tired from a long day at that point in time and they rest up to do it again the next day. Um, typically for us, our matches with our team are Friday, Saturday, Sunday type on the weekends. Um, you know, in the fall season, we'll go to tournaments, typically also on the weekends. So during the week, it's time for them to train and study. Amazing. That's that's really, really good for athletes to hear and for parents to hear as well. And it's good that I've got everything there to succeed. You know, it's up to the athletes to do do the work, I guess. But as my mom used to tell me when I was a little kid, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make it drink, right? So That's right. That's right. You know, and I think that's the most important thing about players having success is accountability and responsibility. You need to be responsible for your own game because if you want to play on the pro tour, there's going to be plenty of times you're going to be out there by yourself um, or there's going to be moments in your career where you're going to be alone and no one's going to be there to hold your hand or give you a schedule. You're going to have to say, okay, you know, I just finished this match, but I didn't serve well and I need to grab a basket and go serve 30 more minutes. If you don't, set those habits yourself, um, you know, during your formative years, during your, you know, the stages of your career that we have them, um, it's probably not going to happen. And so the kids can always ask us for extra work, you know, if they want to come and they want to ask us to hit with them, they know they can text me at any time and I'm going to be there to do it. And then they have teammates they can, you know, they can work with and then they can do it themselves, you know? And so there's, there's so many different ways to do it. And, Maybe they different days. Some days they want to be around the coaches extra. Maybe some days they want to be alone. And sure. all those things are fine. That happens, right? So, um, you know, we just want to provide, as you said, uh, the water for them. And it's up to them how much they drink. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, last thing before I let you go, because I know you're very busy. Um, recruiting red flags. You must get a lot of messages from athletes wanting opportunities. This sounds amazing, of course, especially after this talk. There's a lot of kids that would want to go there. Um, what are recruiting red flags, meaning what are things that turn you off recruiting an athlete? You know, I think the one thing I would say to kids is don't try to justify the results of those things. You know, like I got a message today from a kid, you know, like, giving me like a long list of excuses at the end. Well, you know, my UTR is eight, but it should be a 10. But because of these things, you know, it's like, look, you can say like right now, this is where I'm at. I know that, that I need to be at this level to maybe gain more attention for your program, but coach, I'm going to work for it. And these are the things I'm going to do. And I want to hear about what you you're willing to do, what you're going to do, what you want to do, not what you're not doing or the reasons it's holding you back because you know, typically, um, you know, we as coaches, it's hard to coach a player that always has an excuse every time they they lose. And so don't build those in in the recruiting process and the front end. I would also say I like the kids that take ownership of the recruiting process. You know, sometimes you recruit and the parents are the ones asking all the questions. 
communicating, doing all the work for the players. And, you know, the parents aren't the ones that I'm going to be coaching. You know, the, the student is going to be the person who comes over here and I need to know, can I develop a relationship with this kid? Because, you know, a coach player relationship is so important because you spend so much time together that you need to have trust and you need to be able to know, does this person going to bring out the best in me? And do I connect with them? And you can't do that in the recruiting process if someone else is speaking for you. And so um, I think that's also a red flag. You know, if the kid just doesn't do things for themselves, um, you know, I think that's the two main things I would say is, you know, don't try to make a list of excuses. Just I say, like, this is this is who I am. This is who I want to be. This is my goals. This is what I want to do to achieve. You know, I might take a chance on a kid who maybe has less results, but but they seem so driven. They seem so goal oriented. They seem so passionate about wanting to get better as opposed to a kid that is telling me all the reasons why they haven't achieved, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and trying to justify that. Look, we all go through different times and our games go up and down and all over the place. And there's a variety of levels. And, you know, the one thing I would say to you for all the kids that are listening is there's a level for everybody. There's a school for everybody. Do your research, do your homework and find the school that's the, the right level for you. Um, and that's, um, that's important, you know, find the right spot for you because then you're going to be happy. You're going to be not just necessarily comfortable because I think sometimes you need to be a little uncomfortable to grow, but you need to be in a place that you feel secure and, uh, is the right fit for you with the coaches. So do your, do your homework. You know, um, I, I sometimes worry if I am recruiting a kid and I send a message and it takes like one week for them to respond. It's like, okay. You know, are they going to yeah. stay on top yeah. of things and be responsible? And I, I try to respond, you know, as quickly as I can to the messages because I want the kids to feel like it's important to me. Yeah. But I want yeah. to feel that it's also if you send me a message and I respond, you know, within the hour and it takes you three days to respond back to me, then I'm wondering, like, is this more important to me than it is to you? And look, I mean you never know, you never know what's going on, you know, and, but people make judgments just based on the information that they know. And so as the kid is trying to make a judgment on if we're the right school for them, we're also trying to do the same on our side. And um, I think just engage in the process, be willing to speak with the coaches, you know, with technology now with Zoom and WhatsApp and so many apps available. There's a lot of ways to communicate and get to know the coaches and um, I think that's really important is building that connection and, and being very um, eager, you know, I think that's, that's important because it is a great opportunity and you want to show that you um, are appreciative of that and excited about it and can be a good team member. Coach Young, Coach it's Young. an absolute privilege and honor, honestly, interviewing you. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and um, I've been very excited about this talk. So I thank you for your time. Um, for those that are listening in and tuning into this chat, um, please check out Oklahoma State's Women's Tennis Instagram, Facebook website. Check them out on YouTube. You can even see some highlights from their matches, see what the chemistry is like with the team, how fired up they get. Um, there's campus tours, facility tours, uh, stuff on Google that you can see. Their, their facilities are absolutely incredible. And next time I come to the States, we're going to an Oklahoma Thunder game. Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Let's Whether Stephen Adams is there or not, we're going. We're going, um, and I'll bring you over here, and we'll go watch a rugby game here in New Zealand. I love it, man. I, you, you know, I'm, I'm ready for that. Uh, that's an experience I haven't had, and I have to say I'm just as excited about that as well. So Let's thank go. you for having me on. I, the respect with you is mutual. I appreciate what you do for these kids. They're so very fortunate to have someone there in New Zealand who's doing the work for them, setting them up with opportunities, exposing them to these things, because – Quite frankly, if you don't know about it, um, you know, that's the hardest part. Once you right. know about it, you know that it exists, you know, then you can do the research and you can get to work finding the right fit for you. But um, what you're doing for these kids changes their life. And, and that's really important. So I appreciate you, you having so me much. on as well. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And I look forward to staying in touch. Oh, no, no question about it. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks, coach. All right. See you.